to the Gorgian family, um, which are dedicated to the delivery of the granddaughter Bezat Shem. Grandchild. That could have been just a time. Unless you know something. Or it was Nebua. That's why I got emailed, granddaughter. Daughter is great. I mean, you can find out these things. Now, um, you had actually an international celebrity that was supposed to come tonight. He uh, cancelled last minute. Uh, he's a world-renowned international speaker. I'm not actually an international speaker myself. I spoke in Kobe's brother's house once. Justin, is he here? He's coming. He's coming. Right, that's in Kensington. That's about the furthest. <laughs> so, but you'll have to make do. Now, people have commented that I usually discuss sexual issues, and maybe that's something I have in my mind. Um, <laughs> a lot of the cheering I give here are things which I feel would appeal to a mixed crowd because it's quite you're quite a difficult crowd let's be perfectly honest some of you have PhDs in Jewish literature and some of you have a very um, superficial understanding of the Jewish tradition very rudimentary Jewish education and I have to somehow entertain both of you and sometimes Rabbi Adam turns up I've got to entertain him as well so it's quite challenging. I need something which is something that's equally applicable to all of us. And I would argue that sexual issues are applicable to all of mankind. Well, most of mankind. There's always exceptions. Now, man's sexual desire is a subject that we're going to discuss today. And it is probably considered mankind's greatest challenge. If you simply pay attention to the news, you can see how the sexual impulse is something that defeats man very frequently. If we don't, the statistics aren't good for men. They're pretty good for women. But for men, they don't seem to be very good. Somehow, man's human capacities are severely compromised in a situation of sexual temptation in a way that his capacity to rationalize, his compromising in his broader values, everything seems to go out the window for men when they are confronted with sexual temptations. I'm not saying that women don't have um, sexual desires, but they don't seem to act so irrationally when confronted with those temptations and those desires as <coughs> men do. Um, I have, a, I have a story for you because Tara likes my stories, right Tara? Love, love. Okay. So, uh, something that I feel is universal to all men. All men are sort of built in with this foolishness and this, this lustful potential. And I remember sitting around a Shabbat table when I was single. And there was a girl from South Africa who was um, a very proper girl. And I was discussing... Um, something about having internet in the home and it's too much of a temptation to misuse it or something along those lines. And she sort of looked at me and saying, you are a disgusting man. How would you even think of misusing such a thing? And I explained to her that I'm not saying I would misuse it. I'm saying that man has the temptation to misuse it. All men have the temptation. And she, and she got very angry with me and she said, no, how could you say that? My father is a man and, and he doesn't have such temptations. And she really had a good go of me. But what happened, and my wife's smiling because she knows the story, is that several months later I purchased an apartment. Um, and the apartment was actually purchased from her fiancé. And when I went to the attic to clean it out, it was like several thousand pornography magazines. <laughs> <laughs> you married him, so... She, can, she was hitting me with a handbag. No, 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 that's disgusting. Men are not like that. Um, but the man you married was. So, <laughs> I got my own back. 
there's a gentleman called Dan Savage. The New York Times describes him as the leading sex advice guru. And I have a quote for you from Mr. Dan Savage, source number one. He's written many articles where he basically validates infidelity. And there's nothing wrong with going out of the exclusive bonds of marriage. He justifies every single fetish and every single obsession. And I quote, the mistake, source number one on your sheets, that people make is imposing the monogamous expectation on men. Men were never expected to be monogamous. Men had concubines, they had mistresses, access to prostitutes, until everybody decided that marriage had to be egalitarian. But really, don't expect your man to be uh, a one-woman man. It's not really natural for him, and it's okay to, to delve out of this. Now, what's the Jewish view? What's the Jewish position? To what extent does the Jewish tradition expect us to wage war against this enemy? It doesn't take the position of abstinence, that's the position the Catholic Church will say is the ideal. Um, but then again, it doesn't validate hedonistic man, it doesn't let us surrender to our sexual instincts. To what extent are we supposed to battle? In Tanakh, it seems, there's two categories of sexual sin. Two categories. Some acts in Tanakh will transgress both or will affect both, but some of them will be one of the other. The first category of sexual sin that we see in Jewish scripture are sexual injunctions, illicit relationships where the actual sexual act is forbidden. Examples. A forbidden sexual act. Incest. Incest. Good. <coughs> More. Bestiality. Bestiality. Homosexuality. Homosexuality. Prostitution. Rape. Forbidden sexual acts. Illicit sexual acts. That's category number one. And it seems, it's interesting how rabbis tend to not want to talk about sex. It's quite amusing, really, since it's all over Jewish scripture and all over the Talmud and all over the Midrash. You'd expect that it should be a sort of a main subject that rabbis should delve into. But they seem to shy away on the basis that, oh, we don't want to remind people that they have sexual desires, if we need their reminding that we have sexual desires. But really, it's everywhere. When you see already from the beginning, from, from the beginning of uh, Bereshit, we see the transgressions, these characters, we're not sure exactly what they are, B'nai Elohim, that had inappropriate relationships with women. We see in Parshat Noach, Batishacheta, Aretz, we see that there was a sexual corruption. There were other corruptions as well, but there was a sexual corruption. Even after the flood, it seems, according to at least one tradition, that Noach was raped by one of his sons. We see the Parsha of Anshe Sedom. It actually, in the dictionary, the act of sodomy, is defined by the parsha of the Anshe Sedom, the act of Sodom. Lot and his daughters. And when you go to the Nevi'im, it's not as if it's free of these sexual failures. Shimshon, we had a whole shiur once on the sexual failure of Shimshon. Amun and Tamar, David Amelech, of course, the, the famous uh, Batsheva affair, and Shlomo Amelech himself, which is the subject really of our investigations tonight. Uh, those of us, the Monday Night Nach group, we looked at Achav and his wife, Izevel, source number two on your sheets. There's none other than the evil King Achav who sold himself literally to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. He was incited by his seductive temptress of a wife, Izevel. She somehow brings him to sexual. The sexual failure brings him down and destroys his relationship with God. And there's only really one exception. There's only once in Tanakh where you have a personality that somehow seems to conquer his sexuality and he earns this wonderful appellation. Yosef Hatzadeh. Definitively, the appellation Hatzadeh is reserved for those men, it seems, or that man, in the singular, was able to conquer his sexual desires. You don't have the appellation for Avram Hatzadik is Habin, Moshe is Rabbein. Exclusively, Yosef is Hatzadik, and the Midrash tells us 
is referred to as righteous because he has the, he had the ability to conquer this desire. Look at the source. It's Talmud, it's the tractate of Yoma, source number three of the sheets. Rasha, Omrimlo, we say to the wicked one, why did you not involve yourself in the study of Torah? Imamar, if his answer were to be, I was a pretty boy, right? I'm not just looking at you because you're pretty, man. <laughs> but if your answer would be, I'm too pretty, and therefore since I am pretty, my inclinations are stronger. And you can expect me to not involve myself in women because I'm so pretty. Now, if that was your answer in the end of days, on Rimlo, we would say to him, Were you prettier than Yosef? It's, it's related on Yosef. In each day, he was seduced by the wife of Potiphar. The garments, the dress that she would wear for him in the morning wouldn't be the same one that she would wear for him in the evening. She would change dresses to seduce. She says to him, listen to me. Amar la laugh. He says, no, I'm not going to do it. Amar lo, hareni kubesh tachabbet surin, I'm going to have you imprisoned. Amar la, and he says, quoting Tehillim, it was useful for him to have a copy of Tehillim, since it wasn't written, but interesting. Matira surin, God is the one who releases the imprisoned ones. I'm not interested. Hareni kofefet komatecha, I'm going to bend your stature, I'm going to bring you down. And he says that Adonai zokef kofefe, God will... Straighten the ones that are there. I'm going to blind you. I'm not interested. God can give sight to those who are blind. They try to bribe him. A thousand talents of silver, right? She had to resort to financial bribes. To have sexual relations. He was not interested. And this is the single exception. With an exception of this failure, the rest of Tanakh seems to be describing man's sexual failure. I don't even need to talk about David Amelech with the affair with Bathsheba and all the consequences. And this brings us really to the second type of sexual sin that we have in Tanakh. The prohibition is not the actual act itself. But the prohibition is the extent to which the values are compromised and the sins that come as a consequence of that sexual temptation. When the Talmud is an analysis of the Bathsheba affair, it's not exclusively focusing on the actual potential adultery of that event. It's more interested in what he did afterwards, what it led him to do, how he compromised his broader values, how he tried to cover it up, how he tried to murder Uriah HaKheti, how he lied and deceived and acted immorally as a consequence of that sin. So this brings us to the second type of sin that's involved sexually. The first is actually the illicit relationship itself, and the second category of sexual sin is where the relationship might even be licit. It might be lawful. But there's an immorality involved in that relationship, and there's a compromise of broader values. There is a sexual instinct which leads the man away from his spiritual identity and involves himself in a certain entrapment. He gets involved in dishonesty, he gets involved with fraud. This is not such a strange thing. Many men marry women that are, shall we say, not the purest of women, because of sexual temptations, and it leads them to try and um, sort of feed her desires by doing immoral things and fraudulent things. And it's not so honest in business because she needs Gucci and other things. It, it's not something that is completely bizarre. Man's human rational capacity can be severely compromised in this presence. David's Hamelech sin himself led to so many problems 
with his children, with his family, all sorts of problems as a consequence of the sin. The actual act, the adulterous act, eh, not so interesting. We have also the paradigm of the situation with Bilam when he was, un he was not successful in cursing the Jewish people. What did he do? Who did he hire? When he was not successful, he got a team of highly attractive female Midianites to seduce the men. Now, the, the Torah is not so concerned with the actual sexual act itself with the Midianites. Ah, the, the Torah says, ah, shiksa, not a big deal. Small category of things. What the Torah seems to be concerned with is the fact that once they were involved in those relationships, they started to worship Baal Pa'or because they compromised their religious identity. It was a consequence of their involvement with these women. We see it with American politicians as well all the time. I don't need to go through Clinton, Spitzer, all these characters. But we see the same sort of thing. I mean, you'd say to Clinton, what are you doing? You're in the Oval Room. You're risking everything. People are going to make fun of you till the end of time for five minutes of your personal gratification. It's, it's absurd. It's absolutely absurd. And you don't find many women in history who are, shall we say, as stupid as that. You don't usually find them falling into that character. I believe in the eyes of Tanakh and in the eyes of Chazal, they are very mindful and suggest that perhaps this is man, man's greatest challenge. Now, what I want to take a look at, and you have it on your sheets, is the celebrated parrot of Mishleh. I don't know if you've studied Mishle and for my Monday night group, we haven't gone so much into wisdom texts. We've studied a lot of legal texts in Tanakh and a lot of narrative. Mishle, of course, the Mishle Shlomo, the parables of King Solomon are a separate category. They're a unique uh, mode of expression, modality of expression in Tanakh. This is the wisdom text. It's very unlike wisdom that we have today. And basically, in poetic form, he advises you and he exhorts you on your conduct in life and the decisions you make in life. And this is not really a halakhic concern. This is a, a greater concern. And he writes a poem in the seventh chapter of Mishnah. You have it in your sheets. And I'm going to read this poem to you in the time I have it. Bani. Everybody have it? It's on one side, the poem is on one side of the sheet. Bani Shemor Amarai Umitzvotai Tzponitach. My son, guard my words and hide my mitzvot with you intimately. And this is expressing, this is a customary opening exhortation for the poems in Mishle. Unless one deeply absorbs and possesses this wisdom, you're going to fail. When you're in that situation of sexual temptation, you will fail. You have to absorb this. Shemur mitzvotai vechye. Guard my mitzvot. Now the vav here is very telling. Most people think that a vav in Hebrew is just and. But the vav here means more. The vav here means in order that you shall live. Guard my mitzvot. Vechye. In order that you shall live. Torah And guard my Torah. Ki'ishone necha. Literally like the pupil of your eye. The pupil is symbolic. Of course, it's... Um, with utmost care, we take care of our eyes because of the delicate sense of light that depends on them. And the expression in Tanakh, Ke'ishon Enecha, means like the apple of your eye. Guard it very carefully like you would guard your eye. It's a very sensitive issue. Koshrem aletz po'otecha, bind them on your arms, kotvem aluach yedecha, and write them on the, um, on the, Oh. Anyone got a good pronunciation? The tablet of your heart. Now, it's very interesting. One of the one of the themes and the idioms that is nearly always mistranslated, often by our scroll as well, 
is the concept, the imagery in po Jewish poetry for the heart. The heart in modern language is always associated as the seat of love and kindness and all of these emotions, correct? In Jewish literature, the heart does not have the same representation, and therefore people mistranslate many psukhim. The heart is the seat in Jewish poetry of thought and wisdom. The kleleot, the kidneys, are the seat of your emotions. When we read in tefillah even, bochen kleleot, the one that God is, the one who examines the kidneys, means he examines your inner emotions. When he examines your heart, it means he examines your thoughts, your intellect, your wisdom, your ideas. And the liver is a representation in Jewish poetry. The liver is an organ which is charged with the blood and it's a symbol of vitality of your lifeline. So when we come across the word heart in poetry, we have to think along these lines. It's just complicated for us because in modern expression, the heart is always associated with something else than it is in Jewish literature. You have to say to wisdom, you are my sister. Any poets out there? What does that mean? Say to wisdom, you are my sister. What does it mean? What's your, the poetry your, your mean? Your blood. Your one. Be close with wisdom. <coughs> it's your family. It's your sister. Umoda labinatikra. And to wisdom, to understanding, you have to call that your moda. Moda is like a relative or a close friend. You have to absorb these concepts intimately. It's got to be your sister can't be something that you, ah, you know, sort of came across that idea once. <laughs> to guard you from the strange, the foreign, the licentious, the promiscuous woman. There's a big risk that I'm going to offend a lot of people in this section when I read this poem. But just, just please remember, the author was King Solomon. If you have issues, please take it up with him. I'm just reading and translating good poetry. Um, the... Some, presumably some of you might come out of this thinking that all women are evil, but I don't think that was King Solomon's intention at all, um, and that's not my intention tonight. He's not saying all women are evil, we're saying that evil women are evil. Promiscuous women are promiscuous women, we're not saying that all women are like this, so please don't um, feel that I'm completely generalizing with all of women can't. The Shmorcha to guard you... I hope that was sufficient, a disclaimer. <laughs> My wife is also in the audience. <laughs> Her words are enticing, they're seductive. Her words are very slippery. And now all of a sudden Solomon is giving us a vision. I'm not sure if this actually happened, but he's giving us a vision of himself looking out of his window. And he sees through his window, through the lattice in his window, and he gazes on this dark, moonless night. He gazes on the streets. And now this is the mashal. This is the mishle. This is the parable. And I'm looking at these kids. Naive kids. Gullible kids. Young kids. A bunch of kids. And I discern amongst these kids a boy. A youth, chaser lev, who lacks heart. Now again, in modern literature, somebody who lacks heart is somebody who is mm. mean. In biblical literature, what does it now mean? Not smart. Somebody who's not smart. Somebody who's not thinking. You see the difference? Over bashuk itself pina. He's passing in the streets next to her corner. ad. He steps towards her house. Now, when I read, I read maybe eight or nine translations um, and commentaries on the chapter, and some of them, I think, mistakenly read this pasuk as if he's intentionally walking to this, this prostitute's corner. But I think that's wrong, and I'll, I'll show you why. It's unintentional. He's just a kid, and he's just wandering around the streets. And this is all the vision that Solomon has through this window on this dark night. Beneshef, it's twilight. The Erevion, it's the eve of the day, it gets darker. The Ishon Laila Ba'afila, and it gets even darker. The night proceeds as he's walking in this direction towards the prostitutes. Ishon, of course, is the pupil, 
is here it's a reference to blackness. Before it was a reference to your sensitivity to the eye, protective of your eye. But here Ishani is a reference to blackness, the blackness of the night. Behine Isha Lekrato. Behine, my students, what does Behine mean? My students, not students. Behine. It's an element of surprise. Behine in Tanakh means it's a shock. There's a woman coming towards him. Now that strongly suggests that those translations, which seem to indicate that the boy was going to the prostitute's house, is completely incorrect. Because Vehine is suggesting that he bumps into her. Ishalikrato, there's a woman. Shitzona, she's dressed to kill. She's dressed like a harlot. Unzurat lev, and she is. Um, Again, it's an expression of her wisdom. She's very okay. eloquent. She's very cunning. She's very clever. Now, first of all, I want you to look at Rashi. Look at Rashi, source number four. But he made the shot. Rashi says, Kamash Ma'a. Anybody want to help me? What does that mean? Just like it sounds. Like it sounds. In other words, you can learn this mashal. As a parable, the woman, the harlot, the temptress, the seductress, in this poem that this man is being entrapped with, could be a metaphor, it could be an allegorical for the um, passion for idolatry, for any other sort of evil. You could learn this as a mashal. Rashi says, Kamash Ma'a. We're talking about the evil of licentious women, the temptations of women. Other commentaries, will feel you can learn it about other things. She's a personification of physical desires and so on and so forth. But let's learn the mashal. Kamash ma'a. We're talking about a tempting woman. Homiyahi. She's wild. She's loud. In contrast to the reticence of Najib women, who are sort of quiet, the famous pasuk, which describes them in contrast to the pasuk, source number five, the glory of the princess is within, is internal. Now, rabbis say that to mean women should stay at home and shouldn't go in the streets. I don't know if that's what it really means. I think it means that the women's honor is, is internal, it's private, and it's not public. It doesn't necessarily mean she's not allowed to drive cars. You know, some sects amongst us seem to take that a little bit far. But this is in contrast. This harlot, she's homia, she's wild. She's rebellious. You hardly find her at home. She's always out and about. I think my glasses are sticking up. <laughs> sometimes you see her in the streets, sometimes in the open places. It's so called Pinata Erov. She is lying there in wait in every corner. She grabs this young, innocent boy, and she kisses him. She conducts herself with impudence, with azut panim, batomero, and she says to him, Very strange pastor. She said, you know, today I offered my korban shlamim. Anyone have a clue what she's going on about? She's priesthood. In other words, I've got kebab at home. <laughs> Come, let's, let's do some gusht, right? She's trying to seduce him. The way to a man is through his, his stomach. So she's saying, first thing she's saying is, there's lots of beef in my fridge. <laughs> because I had a korban shlamim, she's also making herself out to be so religious that she had some korban. Now, the korban shlamim, the peace offering, depending on the category of the peace offering, you have First of all, shok v'chazel l'kohen. Mr. Aziz takes the shok v'chazel. And then, sha'ar l'kol adam. The rest of the gush, you can have with your friends, you can have a party. Sudat mitzvah. It's a sudat mitzvah. She's saying, come to my house, sudat mitzvah. Right? She's chapping him. Sudat mitzvah. She doesn't see that there's a contradiction here. You're inviting someone to your house so that you can sleep with him, and you're in the pretext that it's a sudat mitzvah. I think, uh, 
and, and obviously she has limited time to, to finish off the beef. So usually they invite people to join in so that they can complete it within the limited time, depending on the category. I think she's saying something else. I think she's saying that she's mikvah clean. She's just been to the mikvah because otherwise she couldn't offer the korban today. So don't worry about the nidda thing. That's, that's out of the equation over there. So I think she's saying that as well. She's being very personal. She says, you know, I was on my way to meet you. I was looking for you. Literally, I was trying to dawn upon your face. Then I found you. She's, she's, a, she's a harlot. She's interested in what she gets at the end of the evening, right? But she's trying to make out. She's, she's, she's hiring him good. She's trying to make out that she's interested in him. Now, this is a very interesting passage. Marvadim Ravati Arsi, I have spread on my bed these elegant coverings. Hatuvot Eitun Yisrael, I've got the finest fabric sheets. This is going to be a great experience. I've got Egyptian linen, she's saying. Now, I, I believe, I believe King Solomon is playing on another parrot in Mishle with the opening word. Marvadi Mastala. Mar I'm going to sing it to you. So it's number six. Marvadi Mastala. This wonderful, amazing Eshetail. Marvadi Mastala. She made for herself bed coverings. Sheshva Argaman Levusha. And she wears such wonderful garments. This is clearly in contrast to that woman. This is the polar opposite. We're drawing attention to the 31st Perak in Mishra. I'm going to speak of an evil woman here, and the exhortation, the warning is to mankind. Beware of this woman. And there is also a focus, there's also an instruction which is indirect to womankind. There is an exhortation for women not to be like this licentious, promiscuous woman, to be more like the Eshet Chayel, the Marvadim of chapter 31. Nafti Mishkavi Mor Ahalim Vekinamon. Yeah, this is a full sensory experience. I've perfumed my bed, right? She's got... Oh, I'm too excited. <laughs> She's perfumed her bed with myrrh, with aloes, with cinnamon. Right? She's probably got, if there were such things as record players, she's got some sort of sexy music playing in the background. <laughs> look how graphic and look how unashamed King Solomon is compared to modern day uh, rabbinic authorities. Lecha nirve todim. This is, nirve is a cohortative form. It says, come let us become intoxicated with love making, ad haboker, till the morning. Right? Serious need for Viagra. I'm not sure if there was some sort of herbal equivalent at the time, but she's literally saying, let's have sexual intercourse through the night. We shall delight ourselves with acts of lovemaking. Now it changes, the whole story changes altogether because the man ain't home. Who's the man? Her husband. That makes things much more complicated, <coughs> right? Her husband, she's saying, is not at home. But how, sh how does she refer to her husband? Does she say Ba'ali? She doesn't. She says Ha'ish. She speaks to, she makes reference to her husband contemptuously. Cont contemptuously. She creates an impression that she doesn't really have any affection for the man. Like in England, you say, oh, my old man, you know, the old, my husband. It's, it's unaffectionate. It's trying to, trying to convince him but she doesn't really have any feelings for her husband anyway. He just provides the handbags. Couldn't it mean that there is no man at home? Yes, 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 yes. Obviously, the, the whole part of it is that the famous scene that we see in all these TV shows where the man is jumping out the window with his underpants and the husband comes in, honey, I'm home, right? That's not going to happen, she's saying. You're not going to be that guy who's going to have to jump out the window because he is Zalach Bederech Mirachok. He's, on a, you know, is buying jewelry in Hong Kong. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Red faces. So I guess they're flakar. He's taken a lot of money to purchase his merchandise. Le Yom Hakese Yavo Beto. He's going to come back. Now Yom Hakese is translated in several ways. Some say it's Yom Hakese is coming back 
Rosh Hashanah. It's a reference to Rosh Hashanah. This is my only reference to the Chodesh Elul, by the way. It's <laughs> to have any connection. As we see, source number seven, Tikkun B'Chodesh Shofar B'Kesel Yom Hayenu. He says, he's not going to come back till next year. You know? Forget about it. This is not going to be a problem. He tattoo Barov Likha. She persuades him with her eloquence. With her smooth talking, she compels him. And suddenly, naively, he follows her. Pitom suggests again, it wasn't, he wasn't coming out there intending to hire a prostitute. It just happened. What's the expression? Like we say in modern literature, like a lamb to the slaughter. Like an ox to the slaughter. It's the same concept, meaning that um, you're unaware of the impending catastrophe that's about to happen. Like an innocent lamb to the slaughter. We now start to describe him as an animal because he's lost his human capacity to rationalize, to consider the future. He's behaving very animalistically. Like a prancing stag into his trap. Right, Malbim points out something interesting. This pit om, he goes suddenly, in Miami to Mamea, source number eight. If you would just hold on for a few moments, the Sha'il it's at Siflo, and he'll just ask himself, you know, is this right? You know, to take advantage, the husband's away and all that. He would have been tapek, he would have been able to control himself. Add to the extent, he falakets kvedo. He follows her, and the ultimate destiny is he falakets kvedo. The arrow will pierce his liver. Again, the liver we said in poetry, in Jewish poetry, is a reference to the um, vitality of man. He's mortally stricken by this. Like the bird that rushes to the trap. He doesn't realize at this stage that this act will cost him his soul. We don't just mean over here that he has the death penalty for adultery. The consequence of entering this relationship will cost him his life. Ve'ata. And now comes the warning. And now, Banim. Banim primarily referring to the youth. But it refers to all mankind. Shim Uli says King Solomon, listen to me. Hakshiv Uli Imrethi. Pay attention. Pay attention to my words. Al yest el derachayha libecha. Do not let your heart turn to her ways. Don't wander off into her pathway. Don't fall. She has felled many, many people. She has brought down many people. Strong people, great people, many people. President Clinton. <laughs> Top notch. And here is the bottom line. Darchei Sheol Beita. The house is the ways to the grave. Look, it's in the plural, genitive. Darchei. Drachim. It's not that her house leads to the grave, which most mistranslations will say to you. But the way to a house is Darchei Sheol. There's many pathways going from her house to Sha'ol. Sha'ol is a reference, again, in Jewish literature. I've mentioned it many times. Literally, it means a deep pit or the grave. But it's a re reference to the netherworld as well. Once you get entrapped into this, you're not destroyed instantly. There's a gradual destruction. It will lead you to other crimes. Your dot el Khadrimab. Ultimately, there's a dissension to the chamber of death. Quite heavy expression from King Solomon. I've only got five minutes left, I think. Solomon is clearly aware, and we know from the tradition, he writes Shira Sharim in his youth, he writes Mishle, middle age, Kohelet, Kiziastis, he writes in his older years. He's quite young when he writes Mishle before he gets into trouble, those of us who've studied King Solomon. He's clearly aware of the dangers of the sexual urge. He's gazing through the window, and he's gazing through the window of his own soul. This is no ordinary man. Considered by the Jewish tradition as the wisest of all men, 
contributes three books to Tanakh. Under his reign, there is the zenith of Jewish history. He expands the borders of Israel like we've never seen. He builds the temple. He tries to unify the entire world. He tries to usher the messianic era. And what's more interesting, his existence himself, his life itself, is intrinsically related to this challenge, to this sin. How? How is King Solomon's life itself related to this? Thousand right. care about from what? When Yedidya, when Yedidya was born, when King Solomon is born, it's born as a result of what? That God has accepted whose tshuva? David's tshuva. For what sin? The first child of Bathsheba dies. The second one is called Yedidya. We call him Shlomo. And God said, I accept your tshuva in this sin. You failed. But you have the ability to bounce back. And Shlomo HaMelech's life is the symbol of the ability to, for man to survive sexual failure. And what happens to the end of Solomon's life? Have a look at source number nine. The HaMelech Shlomo and King Solomon Ahav Nashim Nochriot. He loved shiksas. Rabot, lots of them. Bet Bat Paro, specifically the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabiot, Moabite, Moabite, Ammoniot, he had a thing for Ammonites, Adomiot, Edomites, Sidoniot, Sidonites, Chetiot, Chetites, the ones for which God instructed us not to intermarry. And God had told you, don't get involved with these women because they will deviate your hearts. He fell in love with those women. And he had 700 princesses, 300 concubines. Not bad. 1,000 women. And they took him away from the path. And when he was old, you wrote the book yourself. You literally wrote the book, but in his old age, the same man that built the temple was taken away from God by these women. And he wasn't close with God, on par with King David, his father. And then the Psukim continued to describe the sins he was involved with at the end of his reign. And the result, his kingdom was divided. Israel was divided into the northern and the southern tribes. The life of King Solomon himself, despite the fact that he wrote the book, describes this second type of sexual failure in Tanakh. Even if, these, even if he had kosher conversions, right? Betin. But Paro goes to the Betin, the rabbis say, good. We're not interested. Remember when we got there in Tanakh? Everyone was asking, did they convert? Did they not convert? The Talmud wasn't even interested. We're not interested whether they converted. We're interested in the fact that they took you away from your path. <laughs> Don't believe in yourself till your dying day. The sexual instinct appears at the beginning of the Fumash and it never goes away. It never goes away. And Shlomo himself fails. He gives us the contrast, though. He gave us the solution. He didn't take it himself. He didn't even have one decent wife amongst those thousand. Not one. The Eshet Chayel that he wrote of was theoretical for him. And that's the contrast. When you choose to be with your wife, when you choose the woman that you wish to live with, you have to understand. You choose right, you choose life. You choose wrong, your dot El Khadri Mavet. You're choosing death. Gentlemen in the room, I'm addressing this half. If you find yourself falling to the temptations of the sexual instinct that we're all born with, if you're finding your values are being compromised by that relationship, pick up chapter seven of Mishlei and give it a read. Shabbat Shalom.